So what is a dynamic process simulation? It is a steady state process simulation that we make time-based. That is the long and short of it. Uh, of course, there's clearly more than that. Dynamic simulation is simply just the same process simulator doing the same things, but it's controlling pressure and flow through the system based on a pressure flow solver matrix. It is a big simultaneous equation that it has to converge to an answer so that if it's changing flow and pressure at one point, that's affecting flow and pressure in another point. All of that is affecting the thermodynamics and changing the density, et cetera. It has to solve all of that simultaneously and then move forward in time. So it's an iterative process. It takes, it converges pressures, temperatures, and flows, moves forward in time, and repeats for as long as you need. So we just finished a study for SASOL. The, the, uh, the duration of the time frame we looked at was an hour. So it moved forward a half a second, uh, solved, moved forward another half a second, solved, and did that uh, 7,200 times to, we got to the answer we were looking for. Sometimes, though, half a second is far too big a time step because the, the changes are so big that the solver can't solve. So sometimes you may be down at 1e to the minus 4 in terms of your time step. So obviously, the more complex, the ra more rapidly things are changing, the smaller the time step means it takes many more computations to get to the answer you're looking for. Take from that that dynamic simulations can take a long time. It's also not nearly as easy as uh, Aspen Tech would like you to believe. There is a dynamics mode button, and much of Aspen Tech's literature will say, great, buy this license and press dynamics and you're going. And that is not quite true because, sure, for small models, you can very easily go from steady state. If you're looking at an exchanger, if you're looking at a column, if you're looking at one particular thing, it can usually handle going from that steady state solution into some sort of dynamic. But if you have a large system, which is what we just modeled, a large system has a bunch of valves, and every valve in steady state is a fixed DP. It does not know, it doesn't have that pressure flow relationship from, your, from a K value, of, determines the pressure drop based on flow, like a valve would. Because the steady state doesn't know that and can't set the pressures because of that, it, it's never, you know, very rarely is a large system good to start in steady state, get it all solved steady state, and move from there. Normally, you have to build it in dynamics mode, and we'll go through that in a little bit. Uh, another reason it's not that simple is that pressure flow solvers are irritable rapscallions. They, the pressure flow solver will decide in a moment's notice, I'm not going to solve this for what seems to be no apparent valid reason. And the art of dynamic simulation is not in setting up the problem, but in knowing what to do then. Because when the pressure flow solver says, I, I can't, I don't have an answer for you. What do you, what do you do? And that basically comes through experience, just doing it a lot. Dynamic simulations, though, are something that any of you in this room could do and could set up. But make sure that you're understanding the physical phenomena going on behind the scenes. Dynamic simulations are powerful, but they're often very counterintuitive. So that gets into the, the, the why for this. For every one of these things, I'm going to tell you what it is, why we would do it, and how we would go about doing it. So for the why, dynamic simulations are, are there because nothing in life is truly steady state. Even if it seems steady state, it's really just a pseudo steady state because it's about to change to something else. So dynamic simulations help us identify where those hazards are, where the issues are, because those usually occur in some sort of transient condition. Something has just happened. A pump has just shut down. Something is happening, uh, a cracker trips. Whatever it is, that's going to cause pressures to rise, temperatures to change. That's where your, your hazards and if you don't have an understanding of what's going on in those situations, you need to simulate it to figure it out. And again, what, what would seem to be a very straightforward, easy solution often is very counterintuitive. Never have I run a simulation and it come out exactly as I would have thought. There is always a wrinkle or 30 that totally throw me that, oh, I, I see why this is happening and I see that it is valid and it is correct, but it is not what I would have predicted. 
And that, for me, makes my job fun. Every, every problem is this shiny ball of a, what is that? I need to go figure that out. It makes for interesting work. Another reason to do dynamic simulation is predictive control. You can build a dynamic system and size and tune your valves before anything's ever built. And this is very valuable for uh, uh, owners uh, like Sassol. They want to make sure that when they go to start this thing up, they have a tool that can help them better set their initial tuning parameters so that they're not spending, they're not wasting time figuring out how to start this up, they just start it up. And then they're never exactly right, but they're really very close and give you a, a very a usable operating scenario to begin with. The natural progression of that is design optimization. Not only is it important that things are safe, your, your hazard analysis, but sometimes things can run better if you know what's going on in those transient conditions. Um, we're gonna go through a, an example here in a minute that uh, we, we learn in this project that it's important that we not only understand the normal case or, uh, for a heat exchanger, but for uh, a very different case and how to go between the two and how to optimize the system to handle that condition. The last is operator training. Dynamic simulations, because they are a representation of a plant in, throughout time, they are very good to show an operator, this is what you would do in this situation. Uh, show them, that if, if this happens, this is how we think, expect things to respond. You need to have responded by this time so that the plant doesn't blow up and people don't get hurt. So with all the studies we do, we always start with a, a study basis. It's probably not uh, new news to you, but a study basis is a terrific way to come up with a collaborative document to gain team agreement. We can, get, we can collect information and build a model, but if we don't in turn say, here is the information you gave us and the information we are using to build this model, that doesn't give the team the time to say, well, no, that's not what we meant. And always it's the case that something is not what they meant. Because uh, the biggest problem in a communication is the belief that it has taken place. Communication never happens perfectly the first time. That back and forth in getting agreement on the study basis is very, very important. But also, that study basis then becomes integrated into the rest of the report so that the final report is a standalone document that has all of the assumptions built into it from the very beginning. We're just, to build the report, we're simply adding to the study basis as we go. Once that's done, you begin building your pseudo steady state model. And always, always, always keep it as simple as possible until it absolutely cannot be that simple. The more complicated you make it, the harder it is for that pressure flow solver to solve. You're gonna create a nightmare for yourself. Keep it as simple as you can, as long as you can, until there is an absolute requirement that you cannot get that information any other way. And as I was saying earlier, you wanna keep it in dynamics mode as you're building it, where you, you add on an element, you add on a stream, you solve it dynamically in, in this, basically let it run flat, and that populates the, the pressure flow solver much better than trying to build an entire model and switch it over to dynamics from steady state. Build it dynamically, it, it doesn't take nearly uh, any longer really than building a steady state, uh, but it, it does make the model work when you try to, when you, from that initial dynamics position. And there's, there are some some art in terms of making sure when you have uh, loops coming back on themselves that you, you get the, the two ends connected to be the, what they, if I think I'm supposed to get 10,000 pounds an hour and my uh, spillback loop is at 3,000 pounds an hour, I need to manipulate the conditions so that if it thinks 10,000 here and 10,000 here when I actually connect them, it's basically a manual iterative process at that point as you're building it. But it is, it is far easier to do that than to try to build it all dynamically and not have it work and bang your head against the wall wondering why it doesn't work. And then you begin running it based on the information and the assumptions you collected in that study basis. And when you begin running it, you're gonna find that it is not what you expected. And you're gonna need either to change the model to better reflect reality or change your assumptions to better reflect reality or both. And usually both is, is the answer. When all that's done, you put it together in a final report, you take that study basis, you put all your results in it, put your conclusions and recommendations in it. 
all that stands together as a standalone document. You don't need to keep track of your study bases as opposed to your results. They're all together in a final document. Uh, that's the best practice I learned at Fleur in California. So what kind of tools can you use to do dynamic simulation? Well, Aspen Tech kind of has the market cornered here with both HiSys Dynamics and Aspen Plus Dynamics. Usually we use HiSys Dynamics because it's relatively easy to use, the models are pretty robust, the elements within them are, uh, are powerful enough to give us the answers we need. If they aren't though, we actually move to Aspen Custom Modeler because Aspen Custom Modeler allows us to write our own elements. If we want to have a particular uh, dynamic, a particular partial differential equation solved, we can make sure that that equation is solved Aspen Custom Model, though, is a, at least when I use it, it's a nightmare of a product. Uh, mostly, if you can get by with using high systemics, which usually you can, that is the better option to go. Invensys also has their product, uh, SimSci, DynSim. It's also a very good product. Uh, it is uh, not, they don't have quite the market share that uh, high system dynamics does, but it's a very good product. If you're starting with a Pro 2 simulation anyway, you might as well look at uh, DynSim if you need to do a dynamic simulation. So to our example, let's say we have a steam condenser and we have steam coming in and cold stuff coming in and warmer stuff going out and condensate coming out. This is what we would see maybe on a, a PFD process flow diagram. So intuitively, we think that if we reduce the flow rate of our cold stuff, all we gotta do is reduce the flow rate of our steam and that we, we achieve the th same thermal balance coming out, that the, the temperature coming out can be the same because we've cut back on our steam. That's very often a very intuitive thing to think. The issue is that we don't have quite that. This is more what this looks like. You have your, your uh, usually your process fluid going through the tubes and your steam condensing on the outside in the shell. And that condensate goes into a condensate drum and there's a vent back to that steam line. That vent is a big deal because as you drop your cold flow rate, you eventually, you just go, I need to cut, eventually not only just turn down steam, you eventually turn off steam. And even with no steam coming in, there's still steam in this system. And that steam condenses and when it condenses, you have steam condensing to a liquid that drops the pressure. You drop the pressure in that condensate drum, it flashes. That flash steam goes back up through that vent, condenses on that coil again, on those tubes again, and now, instead of warm stuff, you have very hot stuff. And for those discerning of you, yes, this was just a giant elaborate ruse for me to say hot stuff to a room full of engineers. But this, this is the big issue, because if you're trying to turn down a condenser, if you don't do so slowly, and you don't have a way to get, as long as there's energy in that condensate, and that pressure is falling, this thermal siphon effect is going to be a big deal here. And so in that steady state, well, all I do is I say, okay, I have this, at the lower flow rate, and the steady state condition ends up with a new steam rate here. But the, the time, the transient process in between can create a very hazardous situation with your process conditions, especially if equipment downstream of this isn't, isn't, uh, isn't designed for the temperatures you might achieve there. And this temperature kind of studies, especially with feed pump shutoffs for a hydrocracker hydro treater, you have that hot effluent coming out of those reactors, you no longer have a, a cool feed to pass against that effluent, what happens? Those, those are very common kind of dynamic study uh, situations because it affects the size and the, the metal, metallurgy of those exchangers. 